Hello everyone, this is Data Driven Formula One with Patrick Hansen Gana Pagrebna. Hi Patrick. Hello Gana, hello all. And today we are speaking about Elio De Angelis, a driver maybe a little bit uh, under the uh, radar of um, many uh, highly talented, very nice uh, character. That's why also uh, we put uh, the subtitle, The Last Gentleman uh, Player. Due to, I mean, he came, we, we will see this, he came from a, a rich uh, family, but, uh, and due to this, uh, had also this uh, sophisticated uh, character, which made him, I mean, practically everybody uh, liked him from the other drivers. But uh, don't forget, he was also very fast. Wow, and he also was a very talented piano player. And uh, if yes. you, there is a lot of footage from Rai, kind of uh, back in the day when he's playing the piano. So yeah, you can also uh, watch that, and that's really cool. Indeed. So if you investigate a little bit on uh, YouTube or other channels, you may find uh, such uh, videos. And very emotional. Yep. <laughs> you will see. I mean, you know, we kind of sort of now uh, used to drivers being very leveled and very yeah. sort of professional. And yeah. this guy is like super passionate. Yeah. yeah. You will, you will, you will, like, if you watch the footage with him, you will understand he's a character. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, you see, uh, and he was uh, Italian, as you already can uh, assume from the name. Who part uh, he participated in Formula One between 1979 until 86, when unfortunately he had the fatal accident. He raced first for Shadow, Lotus, and uh, Brabham uh, in the last year. He was very competitive and, uh, as, as we said, highly popular with fans, but also with all uh, his uh, colleagues, the other drivers. And uh, he has a little bit. Uh, uh, the nickname, the last uh, gentleman uh, player. This, I mean, if we see the uh, history of uh, Formula One, we had uh, a lot of uh, gentlemen uh, still in the 1950s, uh, where practically the drivers coming from a rich background uh, bought the, themselves the cars. Uh, uh, this uh, and uh, some of them. Uh, had been very talented, so it does not automatically mean if you had been a gentleman driver that uh, there had been a gap to the professional paid uh, drivers. Some really had been uh, on the uh, same levels, but of course uh, some uh, not. And uh, speaking about uh, Elio de Angelis, he was a really highly uh, talented uh, driver. Born uh, 26 March of 1958 uh, in Rome, and then uh, his death at a, a training accident in uh, Paul Ricard, uh, France, on uh, May 15, 1985. Uh, he had 110 uh, entries and two, uh, two victories, but uh, two victories you have to consider that he wasn't driving at uh, the number one teams at uh, that time. Although he did have an opportunity to go to Ferrari, and we'll talk about that. Because he was yeah. spotted by Ferrari when he was yeah. very young. Yeah. 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 So his uh, dad uh, was uh, not only was he a uh, he owned a construction company, but also he was a speedboat uh, champion, right? So he was powerboater. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, was very, very successful power water. And uh, if you remember, Patrick and I, we talked about several drivers who had uh, kind of speedboat experience before. Uh, or after <laughs> Formula yeah. One career. So it's, um, I'm, I'm not going to say it's close, but you know, th there seems to be a correlation there between sort of doing boat, boats, uh, speed boats and, um, and driving, yes. competitive driving. Yes, and, and both are very uh, dangerous sports. As and expensive. <laughs> expensive. Expensive expensive uh maybe even more expensive as there's not it's not so commercial as formula one so not that easy to get a big sponsor to uh, pay it uh, and again uh, very uh, dangerous as didier pironi uh, uh, died for example in a speedboat uh, accident uh, but you have an important point here 
So he came from a, a rich, educated uh, background, but as his father uh, was also a, a, a boat a race boat uh, pilot, uh, he got uh, this competition as part of the uh, education. He started uh, in the age of 14 with karting, uh, a little bit uh, some year, years uh, late, uh, maybe. And, uh, but nevertheless, 1975, he became second in the World uh, Karting Championship. And the next year, he won here even the uh, European uh, title. Then he did the uh, classic uh, way. He uh, went to the Italian Formula 3 uh, Championship and uh, won this in 1977. Then uh, next step in 1978, he raced in uh, Giancarlo Minardi's Scuderia uh, Everest, uh, uh, powered by a Ferrari uh, engine, uh, and also uh, raced in the ITC British F2 team. Um, Scuderia Everest, uh, uh, very interesting because uh, later it became a Scuderia uh, Minardi and uh, uh, just uh, uh, just to show a car, uh, they have this typical uh, red and black, as you see as here uh, driving in an uh, open Formula One race, uh, the old car from uh, Niki Lauda. So this is not um, Elio De Angelis but is G.C. Martini, one of uh, an uncle of a later Formula One driver. And also, so he was not only successful in Italy, but also uh, in, uh, in British Formula One uh, uh, championship, uh, which was, uh, I think, existed only one year and later uh, won the prestigious Monaco Formula One race where you have all the talents from the different uh, Formula One um, championships around the world. So really, yes, the money helped to come into racing, but he had also uh, the needed talent. Yeah, and um, uh, he was, uh, because he was very talented, like from uh, quite early age, he was uh, spotted by Ferrari. So he was kind of the contender to kind of go into yes. Ferrari team. So, uh, yeah, so Enzo Ferrari really um, kind of uh, paid attention to, to his talent and uh, yeah. he even tested for Ferrari at one point. So we'll, we'll get yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, practically yeah. we came to this now. Here we go. Yeah. In 1977. Yeah. yeah so as you know, Niki Lauda retired and he he was he did a very successful test for ferrari yep. but then the decision was to go with Gilles Villeneuve, uh, and i think yep. it has to do a little bit with uh, what we've already talked about with patrick um, you know yep. that enzo ferrari was really sort of protective of the italian talent and because of yep. the all the uh, you know, uh, fatalities that they had yeah. with Italian drivers. He was very wary. So there was always yes. someone from a different country on the team. And yeah. I think, yeah, in, in that case, so he just decided that it will be Gilles Villeneuve rather than, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, rather than De Angelis. And yeah, so I think, but which is probably also quite an interesting fact, right? Because Gilles Villeneuve also uh, sort of we lost him at an yes. early age. Yeah, I mean, the next Italian driver would have been uh, later in the 80s, uh, Michele uh, Alboreto. Okay, so the Angels uh, debuted uh, in 1979 in Formula One uh, with the uh, small uh, shadow team. And uh, he had been uh, a paid uh, driver. Luckily, he could, uh, it wasn't that difficult to find a sponsor because uh, directly his uh, father uh, paid for the seat. I mean, this is something which you see up to uh, today and you see this also practically uh, in the first year of Formula One that we have a uh, paid driver. Again, this does not mean that these people are, lack, uh, are lacking uh, talent. Uh, sometimes um, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. It does not automatically mean. <laughs> not, yeah, well, it's not it's not always, but but a lot of times it does. Recently, yeah. I mean, recently, yeah. I think yes. uh, in this case, I mean, he 
he did win quite a lot of you know yes. com competitive uh, driving um, races uh, as a junior so we can say that yeah he deserved uh, the seat uh, yes. but uh, yeah i mean if you look at some of the drivers who end up in formula one sometimes and you think how on earth <laughs> i mean you know how they ended up in formula one <laughs> well yeah i mean yeah. maybe you know in other formulas yes but like formula one i think it really should have you know talent yes but uh, again to be very honest you see this already in the first year 1950 so it's not something that formula one de generated uh, for whatever reason uh, but this was uh, to be honest always the case Um, yeah, so we are coming to the 80s, 80 until 82. Uh, uh, yeah, so and uh, yeah, because of you know, um, Los Angeles was like we said, very, very talented driver, and even though he was driving for Shadow, he was uh, yeah. spotted by Colin Chapman, who was exactly of course, the this... Lotus boss. Exactly. And we need to remind uh, Patrick that we do have a special on Colin Chapman, so please watch it. Uh, yes. It's good um, yes. if if we if we if we say so ourselves. But uh, you know, it, basically, yeah. So Colin Chapman was a visionary, and he always was on the lookout for talent. And he spotted uh, Elio De Angelis, and yeah, was he was invited to Lotus. Yeah, yeah. And this also shows the importance of the small teams uh, like Shadow in the eighties. Uh, I mean, here uh, normally the young drivers. Uh, these are the teams where you go to if only because you won Formula 2 or Formula 3 or you had somehow a, a sponsor who paid for the seats. So you go to the teams where you practically don't have uh, any opportunity to win points. But nevertheless, you hope that you look good, especially in competition uh, with uh, the other, the second uh, driver. And with this, uh, that somebody of the big bosses uh, puts you on the list, like in this case, Colin Chapman. Yeah, and he was also became uh, the the youngest. Well, at the time, now we have younger yeah. people <laughs> driving, but uh, at the time he was uh, the youngest driver on podium in Brazilian mm -hmm. Grand Prix. And yeah, I mean, again, uh, you know, great achievement for him. Uh, very, very competitive, very driven, and very passionate uh, yeah. driver. Exactly. So then uh, 82, uh, Austria, uh, first uh, victory for uh, young Elio De Angelis, uh, a margin of just 0 0.05 uh, seconds before uh, Kiki Rosberg, who uh, at the end would win uh, this uh, championship. A very uh, strange uh, year, 1918, two, on the one hand, great racing, but on the other hand, uh, many... Uh, a very tragic uh, accident yeah and then uh, obviously uh, you know colin chapman uh, died yes at that year and uh, yeah so so that that sort of um i i think that uh, the team uh, was quite shaken by by that yes. yeah we can say yeah, I mean, uh, Colin Chapman uh, was an ic uh, iconic uh, uh, team chef like uh, Enzo Ferrari. So lo losing such a figure uh, can easily lead uh, to the downfall uh, of the uh, game, of the, the team. Uh, sorry. And I think if we see a Lotus uh, the next years, uh, I mean, they had not been where they had been once in the 1970s. Ninety. Uh, so then, uh, it is we uh, Lotus switched from uh, Cosworth uh, to uh, the uh, turbo engine by uh, Lotus. Nevertheless, didn't work uh, really good uh, for Elio de, de Angelis. In the but nevertheless, he won his uh, second Grand Prix as well with yes. the team. Nevertheless, so it wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, actually, you no, know, Lotus was the most uh, lucky car for him, uh, yeah. despite all the. And I think yes. it it kind of is uh, true, you know, for Lotus because Lotus is a very competitive uh, 
ka when you have a risk taking driver inside so it's not a very reliable car historically i mean yes. we discussed it a lot with yeah. uh, with patrick before so the, yeah. they take uh, they used to take a lot of risk when uh, you know first yeah. with the weight kind of they made it lighter and lighter and lighter to the yeah. extent that it was just falling apart uh, uh, during the race so, so um so this this uh, so-called eggshell principle that uh, Colin Chapman yeah. came up with, and sometimes they took it to extremes. So you needed to to be very passionate and very sort of risk-taking driver if you were to handle that type of car. And uh, Elio De Angelis was definitely one of those drivers, and I think that's the reason why you know his two biggest successes in Formula One yeah. are associated with uh, with Lotus team. Yeah, and then. Um... 1985 happened what uh, well as a driver normally you don't want uh, that happens uh, in 84 he was the number one driver but then 85 uh, he got a new uh, colleague uh, uh, Ayrton Senna and uh, of course it was clear to him that with this from the number one position you become the uh, number two driver for the team especially if you consider that Lotus is traditionally a team who focuses strongly on number one. Uh, not a nice uh, idea. Nevertheless, uh, he accepted it uh, and uh, even had been uh, quite uh, competitive. So there hadn't been such an extreme gap between him and uh, Ayrton Senna. So he still showed uh, uh, his talent in this 85 situation. Yeah, but um, Ayrton Senna obviously not the easiest person <laughs> yes. to, to, yeah. Yes, not the easiest based on, on his uh, natural speed, but also, of course, uh, based on his uh, character. Yeah, before we go to his death, I just want to say also that, yeah. um, you know, the fact that he left um, Lotus to Braham was actually yeah. not uh, because of Ayrton Senna. I mean, we'll, actually, we will show you the photo a bit later uh, where they, you know, they, they were quite uh, very friendly to each other. I mean, yes. even despite this uh, situation with like first and second driver. So the reason why he was he left um, or because um, was because uh, the um, Lotus was considering kind of Honda engine, and there were talks about getting a Japanese driver on you know on board. So um, so he put primarily left because of that uh, to Braham. Um, and uh, yeah, because he sort of uh, was put in a situation where he was was also. Uh, sort of forced to kind of pay <laughs> to yeah. stay, which wasn't acceptable to him because he was quite established driver by then. Yeah. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, he's much too young. Uh, this uh, 1986, and this uh, in, in the Brabham BMW, it was not uh, inside the race, uh, but uh, in uh, during training, the training in training. Uh, yeah, Picard. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Ricard in Paul Ricard France. In France, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was a very, again, um, a very famous um, uh, accident because, you know, it completely changed. When we talked with Patrick uh, mm -hmm. about 1986 season, it completely changed the way we do safety now in, uh, in mm -hmm. Formula One. But at the time, the problem was that there were not uh, enough marshals around the, yeah. around the track. And then Paul, Paul Ricard, uh, you know, it's, it's a quite a long um, circuit and not enough people were there to help. And essentially when he, well, you can see kind of the, the photo. Uh, so when kind of the, the car um, suffered uh, this accident, there were not enough marshals to kind of turn the, the, the car um, uh, to, and pick up the driver. So kind of get the driver out of the car. And uh, because it caught fire, he was uh, very badly uh, affected by the smoke. So he inhaled too much smoke. And by the time the helicopter arrived, it was like 30 minute delay. 
Um, and uh, if you if you understand what smoke can do to you, I mean, you basically if you inhale too much, you pretty much have no chance of survival. So by the time they got him to Marseille's uh, hospital, uh, it was absolutely impossible to do anything. And um, yeah, unfortunately, we lost uh, um, this great talent um, yeah. uh, at a very young age as well. So yeah. Yeah, if you remember uh, the famous, uh, it was infamous um, accident by Nicky Lauda, the uh, big problem he was suffering was not directly the uh, the, the skin, um, the brown skin, which you saw, of course, uh, on his uh, face, but uh, the gases, for example, just if you want to get a feeling, uh, you can see um, the Rush movie where he was in hospital, how he's suffering. So this was more the gas and not directly the burnt uh, skin. So he was been uh, 1979 until 86 um, in Formula One, started as we saw in Shadow. Then, I mean, uh, I uh, always uh, relate him uh, to the Lotus uh, team where he had been uh, for uh, six years. And uh, yet uh, the best year in uh, 1984 with the Lotus 95T getting 34 points, third position. And even in 85, uh, where he got uh, Ayrton Senna at his side, uh, still a very good uh, fifth uh, position. And then uh, the tragic 86, uh, where he switched to the uh, Brabham team. We spoke about uh, that uh, uh, he was a gentleman driver, uh, nevertheless very competitive. So let's uh, analyze a little bit the data we have. Uh, first, 1984, and uh, we have the Lotus team with Elio De Angelis and another uh, famous name, uh, Nigel Mansell. So you see first the results of them in qualification and then their uh, race results. On the right, I put a little bit an average. Uh, so if you uh, take just the number on average, uh, Elio De Angelis uh, qualified on the sixth position while uh, Nigel Menzel in average had been on the eighth position. In the race uh, itself, uh, the difference was still uh, bigger. So he, uh, on average, ended up on the eighth position, while the young Nigel Menzel on the thirteenth position. So, uh, so even if uh, Nigel Menzel was uh, quite in the beginning of the uh, career, you see uh, he had uh, Elio De Angelis had Nigel Menzel quite under control, and uh, we, we remember, of course, Nigel Menzel had been a later Formula One champion. So it's not anybody whom he bet in 1984. Under, uh, if you follow us on uh, um, Spotify or YouTube, uh, you see here the photo of the 1984 cockpit of the, his Lotus. So really you see uh, quite spartanic. So really no buttons on, on the steering wheel and also very limited uh, information you get as a driver. So a complete uh, different uh, world than let's say 40 years later in today's Formula One. Interesting, of course, um, the comparison with Ayrton Senna, who for many, many is uh, one or the best driver of uh, all time. Again, here we have qualification and uh, races. Eli Douglas in uh, qualification, average uh, seven position and uh, Ayrton Sender in average the second position. Uh, we have to, of course, to consider Ayrton Sender very uh, talented, very fast, but on the other hand, uh, Lotus, a team which uh, traditionally focused on the number one driver. So you may say that Ayrton Sender had the better material in comparison to Elio de Angelis. Then uh, the races uh, here, Elio de Angelis in average eight position and Ayrton Senna the ninth position. 
Ayatan Senna was very fast, uh, but also had at uh, this time still sometimes an accident. And we also have to be honest, the Lotus was not always the most reliable car. So this, and this again, uh, triggered uh, accidents as Ayrton Senna uh, often drove at the limit and sometimes overstepping uh, the limit. I mean, mathematically, you can't drive 110%. But when you are at 100%, you are practically at the limit and don't have any everything under control all the time, which has the risk uh, of having accidents, of course. So you see, comparison, Elio de Angelis with uh, Nigel Menzel, but also with Ayrton Senna, he was uh, really a highly talented uh, driver and was not here uh, because of the money. Yeah, so that's the photo that I had in mind, as you can see, a very yeah, yeah having so, a having a good constructive conversation. You can tell that it's not an unpleasant one. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, uh, uh, the Angeles have been uh, they have been uh, set back from number one driver to number two driver, which uh, he really uh, which he really took uh, relatively uh, good. Uh, as far as we see. And I mean, he was a very uh, smart person. So I'm sure he, he, he saw that Ayrton Sender is really a unique uh, talent. Uh, so maybe he took it also from the sportive side uh, that he had a great opportunity to drive uh, uh, in the same team as one of the uh, world's best uh, drivers. So again, and here maybe this, I mean, he... Uh, the the lack of a very big uh, ego together with uh, intelligence, I think, uh, helped him to um, adapt to this situation. Well, I mean, um, I, I guess it's um, it's also, you know, if you don't accept that, you probably can end up having no seat. So I think it's like competing is yes. better than not competing. So I think it's also the strategic decision. Uh, but yeah, I mean, considering that this, uh, like, Kind of quite emotional nature. It's quite yeah. uh, interesting to see that he he managed to cope pretty well with that. Yeah, and, and uh, he coped very good. Not only uh, in having a good uh, relation uh, or good working relation, but uh, again also his results uh, didn't seem uh, to suffer or not uh, not that suffering uh, that much. So he not felt into any kind of uh, depression. Or whatever. I must say we uh, we didn't found that much uh, quotes uh, from him, but at least um, some. So let's uh, start with the first one. This pole position proves that it's not fluke that I'm uh, provisionally leading the world championship. When everything going right, I too can be quick and. I think nothing to add to that. Yeah, the, the second uh, quote, I'm just wondering, do you know which race it was? I mean, I found that it was US, but I don't know what no. what was the situation there. Yeah. No, I also don't know this. Mm. Was there a collision with Gerhard Berger? Uh, I don't know. I would assume it was 85 mm -hmm. or... I, I found it interesting uh, because, as we already uh, uh, mentioned various times, uh, very well educated, uh, very sensitive uh, piano player, but nevertheless, uh, if needed, he can also get a little uh, more angry. So, you, uh, as you see, you must realize that you have, uh, and then uh, due to YouTube, spoil, spoil, spoiled <laughs> my race for me, let's just say, yeah, we had to, yeah. with a little YouTube, bit YouTube. stronger language. Uh, exactly. So to due to uh, YouTube regulations, uh, we censored it. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you can imagine what he said. Uh, uh, so I found this interesting uh, also to show a little bit. Yes, he was intelligent, educated, sensitive, but also, of course, uh, he could get angry. Then last one, the spare car was totally different to my race car. 
it was much more difficult to drive as it both understeered and oversteered. Uh, and this was another uh, important point in racing in the 80s. Uh, each team, well, uh, maybe some of the small, very small teams not, but the big teams, they came with three race cars. This is, uh, and normally the race car was, had the set up for the number one driver. And this, if for whatever reason, let's say there had been technical problems in the qualifying or just the one of the drivers thinks that their normal car, the setup is not working, they could uh, switch to the uh, spare car, uh, something which we don't have anymore for many, many years in uh, Formula One. But again, uh, especially if you are the number two driver, the spare car was normally not working very good for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just trying to find, um, again, I just want to ask uh, maybe if you're watching this and you know where this quote uh, comes from, from you know, um, like under which circumstances Elio de Angelis said that to, to um, uh, Gerhard Berger. So just, just tell us, yeah. That yeah, so if know. somebody knows, uh, you can uh, comment uh, this to our video. Here, uh, photo uh, Elio de Angelis uh, with the uh, Lotus uh, design, which they also had for uh, one, two years. So it's not only that he drove the classic uh, black gold, but also the Essex design with the blue, white, and uh, red. So here, as uh, Gunnar, as you already mentioned, he was a very gifted uh, pianist. Uh, for example, uh, one famous example in 82, before the start of the season, the drivers had been thinking to go on a strike due to their... Uh, well, they locked themselves up, right? They did lock themselves yeah. up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And uh, as uh, this was uh, quite boring and also to keep uh, the mood... Uh, uh, good uh, Elio Angelis uh, did a performance playing Chopin and uh, Mozart. And uh, you see here um, a photo, I don't know from which uh, occasion, but I think this also uh, aligns with his uh, character. Uh, again, uh, educated, uh, more sensitive uh, person, more uh, emotional. So you see him here uh, on a white uh, piano having a light yellow sweater. So uh, think this underlines uh, his uh, character. Well, it's, um, I mean, there are quite a few um, uh, videos that you can yeah. find from, especially from Rai. Uh, I mean, the, he was uh, kind of playing in public quite a lot. Yes. And uh, there is definitely footage. And I believe there is a, even an interview where he plays the piano as well. So there is kind of a little bit of a conversation and yeah. um, uh, he plays piano. But yeah, please, uh, yeah, find, find, uh, um, his uh, piano playing videos um, uh, on uh, YouTube or on other platforms. And yeah, it's uh, a del delight to watch. Yeah, there are not many uh, drivers I remember uh, who are good at the piano. Uh, one should be uh, Charles uh, Leclerc, as he also learned uh, playing piano. I never heard him playing, but he mentioned it in some of the interviews. Well, we, we have rappers and uh, <laughs> <other>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, anyway, uh, so the yeah. music yeah. seems to interest uh, Formula One drivers, let's just say, <laughs> not necessarily playing the piano, but yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, huh? helmet. Yeah, helmet. helmet. That's, a, that's, a, that's the iconic helmet. And, um, you know, you're probably all familiar with it. I mean, you probably saw it uh, one way or the other. So he had this really, um, you know, uh, iconic design for his helmet with uh, red, blue and, and white colors. Yep. And, and uh, uh, this design yep. was repeated by others. Exactly. And uh, again, we are uh, in the 1980s, meaning uh, a Formula One driver had practically this design for his uh, whole career and opposite uh, to today. 
where uh, most of the drivers uh, change the helm design from race to race, ask different artists to do this, and practically do not have uh, a signature helmet uh, anymore. So this is the, the one uh, who uh, Ilio de Angelis used, and this was uh, an inspiration by uh, others, especially his uh, semi uh, patria uh, whom the French Italian driver uh, Jean Alesi, who later had his debut in 1989, and he uh, paid homage. And you see here his helmet uh, is practically uh, identical with the design from Elio uh, De Angelis. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, we're probably wondering why Jean Alessi, because a lot of people think that uh, I mean, he's a French of him as a French driver. Well, yep. he's a French driver of Italian descent. Uh, his yep. dad is actually from Sicily. And yeah, right. so this is the reason why he, um, you know, he kind of, uh, Elio De Angelis is one of his sort of uh, uh, role models. And yeah, he sort of uh, did it uh, in... Um, uh, you know, in memory, uh, to, to pay homage to 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 Elio De Angelis, you know, with his correct and, correct and uh, but that's not I the only one. <laughs> that's not the only one. And, but that's uh, not 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 the only one. So we also had uh, uh, Jean Ric uh, Vanier, uh, who yeah. is a French driver, but his yes. one is a is a respect to to Jean Alessi. <laughs> so. Yeah. And uh, this helmet was uh, used, uh, so if you're watching us on YouTube or Spotify, yeah. which we really encourage, uh, so you yes. can see that uh, the very similar helmet was designed for, for, for Jean Requenier uh, for the Monaco Grand Prix yes. in uh, 2012. And that's, uh, yeah, that's the, that's sort of the tribute to Jean Alessi. And uh, yeah, Jean and Alessi the... obviously made a tribute to Elio D'Angelis. So ultimately, this is a, a tribute to Elio D'Angelis. Yeah, and this is uh, what we just uh, mentioned. Uh, Jean Alesi, uh, he used this design in the, his whole uh, career in Formula One. Uh, but today, and uh, like already in the 2010s, uh, uh, you changed the design practically from race to race. So one race, you maybe use a uh, design uh, as an homage the next time. You ask another artist or do whatever, but you don't have this one helmet as we still saw in the 1990s, for example. Yeah, so. and these are the three uh, helmets yeah. all together. Again, if you're watching us on YouTube or Spotify, you yeah. can see uh, kind of side by side. And yeah, they're very similar. Very yeah. similar and uh, and also, I mean, a, a very a good design, very simple, very clear. So. Uh, we a real good design from an also from an uh, aesthetic yeah, and, point. Yeah, and kind of very French as well because of the colors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Even though obviously both uh, Elio D'Angelis and uh, uh, Jean Alessi. So Jean Alessi, when he was born, he was called Giovanni, Giovanni Alessi. So he, uh, yeah. like later, he became French citizen. But yeah, originally, yeah. like I said, he's he's. Um, his dad is definitely from Sicily. I think his mom is also Italian, uh, I believe. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think both. They yeah, immigrated yeah. from Sicily to uh, France, if I'm correct. Okay, that's all for today. All right. Well, yeah, as usual, we would like to encourage you to subscribe uh, to us either on YouTube or Spotify where we are present in the video format and we are present in many, many different, many, 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 many different platforms in podcast format. And thank you so much for your attention and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye bye.